image. Okay? So please work on your wiki. In fact, you will be graded against your wiki. When I look at your code, I'll be looking at the wiki and find out what you're trying to build. When I look at your database, I'm going to go into the wiki and find out what you're trying to build. When you submit your code, I'm going to go into the user stories and functional requirements and I'm going to be taking a look at what you are building. And I'm going to grade you against that for next week. But we cannot fall behind. So tonight I'm covering Spring, the very basics of Spring. We're going to be covering our first controller and our first entity manager. And I'm going to be showing you how to implement that because that's also due next week. Now, back to the project. I remember very clearly last week I said, guys, try to keep the names of your properties and field table fields as simple as possible. If you start putting underscores and dots and all kinds of funny characters, Hibernate is going to have a problem. In fact, I showed you guys last week the kind of SQL statement that Hibernate creates in the back end automatically. As you can see, there's a bunch of underscores in there. If you create field tab table fields with underscores and properties in the classes with underscores, I don't think Hibernate is going to like it. Just keep it simple. You want a combined word? Okay, put them together camel cased. That's fine. Typically, they should start with lowercase because it's going to end up being a variable in, in a Java class. And all variables in Java should be, they don't have to, but they should be lowercase, the first letter at least. Only classes start with a capital letter. For the same department, several timesheets assigned to or charged to it. So there's a many to one with the department, which means there are many timesheets that have the one and same department, and there are many timesheets that have the same one employee. That's what that's how it should be read. That's how it should be understood. Okay? So the relationships, the responsibility of the relationships is on the main entity. How does that reflect on the database? Well, if we take a look at the database, notice that timesheet table, which is the main, the most important table, has, since it's the one that has all the relationships, has an employee ID, which is going to be the link to our employee table, and it has a department code, which is going to be our link to the department table. Department code an employee ID, it's what it's typically called a foreign key. Because in another table, there are keys. Now, what I ask you to do is make sure that you do not declare to the database, you do not declare these two fields as foreign keys. You could have done here in this section. You could have said, okay, employee ID is a foreign key to such and such table, and department code is a foreign key to such and such table. Do not do that. I think I said that. Still, some students call me, hey, why isn't this working? The database was trying to handle the consistency of the foreign keys. Do 
not do that. Let Hibernate manage the consistency of the foreign keys. Okay, so... Another problem that students had was when you were executing Hibernate test, and I'm going to show you my executing. I ran it as a Java application. Everybody was noticing, hey, professor, I'm getting log for J1. No appenders could be found for logger. What does that mean? my project is not working blah 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 okay first of all this is a warning that's what log4j colon warn means it's a warning you don't really need it to run it but the way to fix it and this is something that I'm going to be covering I was hoping to cover later on but I might as well cover it now it's log4j it's one of the libraries that we are using. In fact, if you guys expand on the library folder, you will find a log4j 1.2.11.jar. Okay? So what is log4j? log4j.apache.org. Yes, it's one of those projects from the Apache Software Foundation. Okay, it's logging now. It's logging.apache.org. Also called Apache Log4j. Okay. This is the library that allows you to, through configuration files, allows you to modify the amount of logging that your system generates. Now when you're building it, you want as much logging as possible because you want to be able to see what's going on, what what warnings are you getting, what what errors are you why are you getting those errors? So you want a, a lot of logging. And your project should have loggings and some of the libraries that you depend on in your project will also have loggings. Everybody familiar with what a log is, right? Just a whole bunch of messages to tell you, hey, I'm going through this statement. Hey, I just grabbed the timesheet. Hey, I'm going to print out the employee name for this timesheet. You know, stuff like that. So that you know where your project or your code is going through. It's called logging. Okay? Well, instead of every single system creating their own logging through the output console, through a file, through and creating a whole bunch of code just for logging, the Apache Software Foundation decided, hey, why don't we create a framework, a logging framework that we can include in any project and as soon as you start your project you can determine how to log and at what level to log. So if you're developing you want as much logging as possible. What is called informational logging or info. Everything. You want everything logged. But if you are putting this system in production, you don't want to be wasting machine memory resources on logging. It doesn't make any sense. Because it would also slow down your system. So you will put your logging level at errors. You want to know when there's an error. But you don't want to know if there's a warning or if there's some informational stuff. So that's how log4j created these all these levels. So log4j has the following levels. It has the auth 
totally off, meaning I'm not going to log at all. And I don't want any part of my system to log at all. Or there's fatal. Fatal means I want to know the real bad problems. I want the system to log the real bad problems, nothing else. And then error. I want not only the fatal ones, but also all the other errors. And then warn. Warn means I want to know the fatal errors, all the errors, and any warnings. Info, pretty much everything. There's a typo in there. It should be info and then debug, separate. And then all. All would just log absolutely every single comment in the source code. And guess what? You can adjust that logging level, which is what it's asking here, saying, hey, no appenders could be found for logger. This guy, this guy, org hibernate config environment. Somehow, our hibernate library gotta have this environment class that is asking, hey, I need to log. And it cannot find any appenders. Appenders are usually either like a stream output, like a like a the console or a file or whatever. And then it says, please initialize the log4j system properly. All it's saying is, I need to see the configuration for the logging. So what you do is, you create a log4j properties file in your source, you know, in the same directory where you have the, uh, the Hibernate configuration and the, and the entity m Hibernate mappings. And this log4j will look something like this. Log4j root logger. You specify the level that you want. Let's say all. And then you specify where is it going to log to. The default is standard out. And standard out defaults to, in this case, in the Eclipse, it defaults to the console. If you execute it in Apache Tomcat, it defaults to the Apache Tomcat log. Okay? So everything that shows up in here in the console will show up in the Apache Tomcat log. That's the standard out. But what if you want to have your own file, your own log file, or the system has a, your own log file? Then you can create a log file. And you can tell it what's going to be the name, and what's going to be the layout, and what's going to be the conversion pattern, and all that stuff. Okay? So the standard out, the standard out is going to be the log4j console, console appender. So that's like the default, right? The layout is the pattern layout. That's also the default. And all this stuff, if you look at it online, you will see what the pattern, all the different patterns are out there. And then the conversion pattern, it's how the information will be printed on that console. So it will have um, dollar sign D probably means uh, date. I'm not sure what P means. C, M and N. All these are the different parts of the message that can be logged. And you can look at take a look at the conversion pattern. Log for J conversion conversion pattern. Yeah, that conversion pattern be all that stuff. So C is used to output the category of the logging events, and capital C is used to output the fully qualified class name of the caller. So who called this? Capital C is the uh, D is used to output the date of the logging event. So at the moment that it's being logged, the date. Capital F is used to output the file name, and L is used to output the. Uh, the location information of the caller. 
and capital L is used to output the line number from where the logging was requested, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you, you read all the different things, and this is all the stuff that you can actually log, and you can do it in any pattern. If you want the date first or you want the date last, it's up to you. You just specify in here. This is the pattern that I want you to use when you output the log to the console, which is the standard out. And this is the pattern that I want you to use when it's to the file. Okay? Now, right now, the root logger is logging absolutely everything into the standard out. It's not going to log into the log file. If we wanted the log file, then we will put log file in here. Okay? But I'm not going to log into the, the log file yet. So once you create that, and if, if you don't want to type all this stuff, guess what? You can go and say log for j dot properties example. And here it is. And then you just copy it and use it. <laughs> okay? Or I'm going to be publishing. I'm going to be publishing uh, tonight's project, which will also have the log4j properties, so you can reuse that one. Anyway, so once you create that, let's run it. You want to see all the logging that is behind the scenes? Be ready. Be prepared. Didn't do it. Log for J. Jeez, if I could spell. Log for J dot properties. Now you cannot change that name. That's specific. Log for J dot properties. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to run it again. Now you can also run this by right-clicking on the project and saying run as an application, as a Java application. You know what that's going to do? It's going to go th through all the classes in the project and it's going to look for the ones that have the main. And it's going to find it. Here it is. Oh, you mean Hibernate test main? Yes, I mean that. Look at this. Look at this. Look at all the stuff that got logged. Hibernate 3.1, Hibernate properties not found. Using C leg reflection optimizer. Using JDK 1.4 handling. Configuring from resources, Hibernate.cfj.xml. Look at this. Connection driver, I got the, your connection driver. Connection URL, I got that. The username, I got that. Password, no password, I got that. Show SQL, yeah, true. Then it's going to all the mappings. Look at this. Mapping department. Mapping properties, timesheet ID, and all that stuff. This is all the logs from the Hibernate framework. Yes, that was the framework that we're asking for logging. See this? And it will tell you the level. Remember the, the stuff that the pattern that I asked you? Look, this is the pattern. I want you to put in here the timestamp. This is the date right now and the time. Then I want you to put the level, info, debug, whatever. Then I want you to put the class that it's coming from. And then I want you to put the message. With logging all, you can see exactly everything that is going on behind the scenes when you execute your project. absolutely everything. Now, what's the drawback? What do you guys think is the drawback of that? Exactly. Too much information. Sometimes it's so much that the actual output of the program is difficult to find. I can't, through all this log, I cannot see, oh, here it is. This was the last statement that I put from the output of my program. Timesheet ID equals 1 is from a J Kumar, blah, blah, blah. 
but it's all hidden within the log. Okay? So, you gotta play with it. Let's do, let's do, not all, but let's do warn. And then execute it again. Nothing. Warnings. I didn't get any warnings. This is the execution. What about info? I'm sorry? Yeah, this is the SQL, and the SQL is part of the Hibernate uh, configuration. Remember we said SQL true? Show SQL equals true? That's why it's showing up. <coughs> so I'm going to change it to info and save it, and then run it again. All right, I'm getting more now. A little bit less than all, but a little bit more than one. Here it is. So I get the important stuff like, okay, Hibernate, it found the, found the, uh, the Hibernate mappings, it found the configuration XML, I can see that. Now it's using Hibernate building connections, I can see that. Then there's JDBC generate keys, maximum auto, da da da, second level cache, blah blah blah, Pojos, and then here is the output to my project. It's a middle level, comfortable level, not too much. All right, now finally let's do the log file. I could not find value for key log and stand log file. <laughs> yep, you are right. There it is. So now, if you guys refresh your project, notice that in the root of your project, you have a Timex log. If you double click on it, this is the file. So you can save, you can save logins from a particular run, from a particular test, and then find out exactly what's going on with your, at least you can research, or if you have What I would like to do now is I would like to go into the textbook. And I don't have the textbook. Where is the textbook? Books Spring. Specifically, I want to go into this part. Okay. Your book contains on Chapter 2 the section Applying Extreme Programming and AMDD, which is uh, Modeling um, I forgot what it stands for. Um, some method methodology of design. 
uh, to our sample application. So it's actually applying those two developing um, ways of, of way, um, two different approaches at developing in a, a system. And they are trying to apply it to the way that the Timex, the online Timex system is being built. So the first thing is the domain model, which you guys already created up, right? You, you guys already created the domain model. Now, what I want you to start doing for next week is the UI sketches. The UI sketches is nothing else than a snapshot of the user interface. That's it. That's all there is. Okay? Now, you can't... Most probably in Moodles, you cannot paste it you cannot paste the HTML. That's fine. If you can't do that, that's fine with me. But at least paste a snapshot of the HTML being rendered. So if you open the browser and you you should have the HTML already by this point. Okay? At least for the home page and the and the login page. Um, what you should do is render it in your browser whatever that is, and then take a screenshot, save it as a PNG, JPEG, I don't care, and then upload it to the wiki. So when I go to the section, when I go to the section called UI sketches, right here, that's one of the sections, yes, that's one of the sections that should be part of your wiki homepage. When I go to the UI sketches, I should be able to see a list of UI pages, user interface, login screen, timesheet list, enter hours, print hours, approve timesheet. And when I click in any one of them, I should be taken to the right snapshot. So tonight, tonight, we are going to implement this guy. Timesheet list. Is that the first one? When you go into your system? No, most probably not. But it, according to the specs, this is the functional requirement that is the most important one. Every employee should be able to see a list of their timesheets. That is key functional requirement in this project. That's why I'm building it first. Does that mean that I have to do the logging and all kinds of... No. We're just going to concentrate on, done on that functional requirement. So I need you guys to create the HTML, the nice pretty HTML that it's going to... Give me an idea what it's going to look like. Yes, it can be fake data. Some of you say, oh, but I can't do that because it's coming out of the database and I don't know how to grab it out of the database. And I'm asking for a screenshot of a hard-coded HTML with the look and feel of your project. This is the look and feel for timesheet list. Does it, is it true that I have a January 21st, 2007 period and date timesheet with 39 and a half hours from timesheet ID 1234 in the database? No. You can put whatever you want in there. It's fake data. It's just give me an idea of what... It's a mock-up. Give me an idea of what that screenshot is going to look like. Now, for tonight, you guys were supposed to build this storyboard. The storyboard is going to give me an idea of the flow of the different users in your website, the flow inside your system. So, what you guys have to build for next week is the equivalent to the timesheet list. Am I asking you to do a timesheet list? No. 
Why? Because most probably your system will not have a timesheet. But what I'm trying to get at is I want you to build the most important functional requirement in your system. In this case, for time mix, it's timesheet list. How do I know that? Because if I take a look at the storyboard, guess where everybody is going to as soon as they sign in? Wild guess. Timesheet list. That's where everybody is going to go. And in fact, this version of the storyboard, which is the one that the author shared with us, it's not a really good one. Version 2. Here it is. When everybody signs in, this is where they're going. Timesheet list. That's the right storyboard. From there, from the timesheet list, they can go different ways depending on who they are. If they're an hourly, if there's a the manager, if there's an accountant, if there's an executive, blah, blah, blah. Okay. I also need from you a list of user stories. And again, the book on Chapter 2 gives you an example of what a user story is. Given the business requirements and the UI prototypes defined for time expression early in this chapter, we can now define a set of user stories for our application. Okay? User stories, also called use cases, come in many formats. But the most familiar the most familiar one is formal, brief, and casual. And I want you to make the casual one. This is the casual one. There is a number to a user story. So when you refer to it, when you and I refer to it, we know exactly what your story story are, are we talking about. User story number two. Oh, yeah. User story number two. I know what that is. It's called timesheet list. What's the story description? List employee can see a list. Uh, I'm sorry. Employee can see a list of timesheets previously entered and click the ones that can be modified. It's about. What's next? The priority. You guys have to start developing priority one user stories. Those are the ones that are key to your system. Without those user stories, your system wouldn't make any sense. Okay? And then you're going to put an estimate. It's also call, called points or estimate on the effort required. And some of them are one, some of them are twos. You guys are going to have to develop two user stories of one point every week. And you can develop one user story of two points. Those are the heavy ones every week. So you have a choice, either a one user story that's heavy, two points, or two user stories that are lighter, one point. I want to see this list of user stories in your wiki.